Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Podcast Pasta. That's a podcast that's like pasta, not the podcast that's about pasta. As always, I'm your host, Mike, and today I'm coming at you with the first original guest of 2024. Uh, he is John Bayer. Am I saying that right? John Bayer or Barr? Bauer. 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 John Bauer, yeah. you are a writer you have written both uh professionally for a number of different um companies i think i saw a uh, game loft amongst yeah. your resume um you also do personal writing you keep up with your own um blog as well as you know you've written i, I believe like three novels so far that i've seen uh john how are you doing today i'm doing all right it's uh, the evening here in uh, france i live just outside paris so i'm settling down with a nice little bit of wine and an even better conversation well hopefully not too much <laughs> wine <you know? laughs> oh, yeah. not yet um, it's not friday yet right? um but no so i gave you so the way i always like to lead these uh, interviews as my listeners like to as my listeners know is that um you know i I, I guess if you can expand on the introduction I gave you and I guess in your own words explain what you do and what motivates uh, your work. Okay. So, um, like Mike just said, uh, my name is John Bauer, John M. Bauer, as I like to go by for my books. And I am, as I have to say, words and stories. I write and I tell stories. And what I like to do, whether it's professionally or personally, is to find new ways to captivate audiences and bring them into a world that I have created. Yeah, and, um, I, uh, and I, I think a part of that too that I, I was also interested in bringing you on the show is that I saw that your background, at least your educational background, is um, also in languages. Though that uh, you you yeah. actually speak like multiple languages, correct? Yeah, it depends on the day. It's kind of. Uh, uh, very much uh, in, uh, uh, many years ago, I was more interested in languages than I am today. It's more just a pragmatic reality of my current life. But I am very interested in the idea of languages and expression and um, how people around the world express themselves. And language is usually a big part of that, but more important is the culture behind the language. Because uh, uh, what I was told once and what I repeat often is that... Uh, a culture is the really important part because people around the world, they have different cultures that just happen to be in other languages. Well, Ryan, like culture, like kind of fuels like language, common, you know, um, common slang, like different things like that. I would imagine. Uh, or, uh, uh, more, uh, or more relevant to me is it fuels stories. Right, exactly. And what, whether what you're talking about, like no, novels and books and characters and that kind of thing, or advertising and marketing, it's all stories, or at least through the lens that I choose to see the world. Um, but you are like monolingual, or I meant not mono, sorry, uh, like multilingual, correct? Yeah. 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 So um... my uh, my uh, my main languages are my native language is English, American English, as anyone listening can hear. And then I live in France and I speak French. Um, and then I also speak Mandarin Chinese. And those are the three languages I mainly use. I did my master's in, also in, um, in French and Spanish. I spent some time in Korea, but a lot of that's kind of deprecated over the years. But I can still relatively read it. And I imagine speaking it, I'd have to study it for a while and then I could uh, pick it up again. And then I have a, a smattering of other languages because I studied a bit of linguistics. So. On some level, when you have that kind of knowledge, you can learn a grammar and you can learn the structure or a writing system. It's about memorization and learning the logic. Um, and then after that, it's just you, memorizing vocabulary is the really hard part about learning the language because that takes forever. And I haven't committed that to a bunch of languages. Perhaps if I had no other uh, worries in the world, I could uh, I could do that. So, uh, and I'm, I'm, I apologize that this is kind of a bit of a of a tangent for you or yeah. for the context of this Almost conversation. Fine. But um, I always like to ask people that speak like multiple languages, like when you're holding kind of an internal dialogue within your own head, what language mm -hmm. do you think in? Uh, it's mostly English. It's my native language, so I'm going to be mostly in English. And um, sometimes I can switch for fun, but it's not very. Uh, um, 
I don't know, it's just kind of a fun thing. If I just kind of let myself go, it'll be mostly in English because that's kind of, that's what I spoke as a child. And until, even until my uh, late teens, it was the only language I really spoke. But I can force myself. I mean, you can too. If I was, if I wanted to force myself to be in another, to think another language, I could, and then maybe it would become more natural. I think that's pretty common for people who are a bit more, um, uh, like if you live in France, for example, and you work every day in English sometimes, and you consume only English movie and American movies or whatever, and you listen to Taylor Swift and then a bunch of English speaking uh, musicians, then you end up start thinking more and more in English and this kind of thing. Right. Like I've gotten different answers from that question. I like, yeah. I think I've gotten some people that would, uh, that say that, um, you know, if usually if they're very emotional, they'll think more in their like native language, especially like, yeah. if, you know, like English wasn't their primary language. They go back to like that primary language. So it's just, yeah. it's just an interesting psychology thing. Uh, like to yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's because I mean, I'm in the other direction, right? Like it's very, uh, I mean, it's like that even in your first language for a lot of times, like when you go to the doctor and they start using technical jargon, even in English, you won't understand it. Uh, it's like that just for other specific kind of things, right? Like, um, uh, I don't know how to say silverware in every language that I know how to speak, especially like Spanish. I only know very academically and that would be hard for us to talk about things around the house. But I've also, you know, I've given talks in Spanish, so it's very, um, it depends on how it's used and what, how it's relevant to your life, I think. Makes sense. Um, so focusing on your writing, I think um, you're kind of more unique for my show because you've written in both um, kind of both this personal, like in both your personal life for your own personal need as well as uh in a professional setting. So I, I guess I'm kind of curious to kind of con compare and contrast the two aspects of that. Like um, what challenges do you find that are unique to one versus the other? Um, I would assume that you probably like writing more for yourself personally, but maybe I'm wrong. So uh, yeah, I guess compare and contrast the two types of mm. like writing that you engage in yourself. Yeah, I break it down a bit further than just personal and professional. I break it down between um, corporate and uh, freelance, especially. And what I, I mean, I use these two words, but what I mean is something that has to go through many stages of approvals and something that you can publish yourself. Um, and then the, the other kind of access there being like things that you just are personally interested in as an art uh, versus something that you're paid to care about. And um, uh, all four of them have different kind of ways that they tug at your heart and your uh, and your life because uh, i mean yeah it'd be great to be uh, uh able to just focus on my art and have people invested into the worlds and characters i make in my novels but it's also good to be able to eat so <laughs> um so uh, you know letting some of yourself go to take on projects that might not be exactly what you're into, but crafting, finding a way, or at least what I look at it in that case is finding a way to draw a story or have entertainment for myself uh, in a rather dry subject sometimes. Um, and then the other kind of contest there is like if you're doing something in a much more controlled setting, a much more corporate career set, uh, kind of thing is when I mean, you, you're going to be stuck with approval layers and this kind of thing. Things take, it takes like, you know, six months to get anything through sometimes. Um, and that sucks, but it comes with incredible stability. So then maybe, maybe, you know, your, your, your nine to five sucks and you feel like you're going through hell every day, but you have the stability and the free time to pursue uh, the art comfortably, right? So all these things have their, uh, their, their pluses and minuses and, uh, I think, depending on your stage in life, you find yourself more or less in one or the other. Right, but I mean, I guess I would make the argument isn't like a lot of writing jobs in general, like isn't writing broadly as like a, profes a profession very like volatile in terms of like the type of work, because a lot of it is contract, a lot of it is like... It depends, like you can get, a, you can get, a lot of it is contract, right, especially entry level stuff, but I mean writing as a career as a kind of creative writing this kind of thing if you're thinking about it as a career it's going to fall usually under um 
like in games, which I have a more uh, experience in, they call it narrative design, right? But then what I worked in much more often was the marketing side of things, which falls under communications. And so um, when I was, you know, I was spending every week writing 50 plus pages, but it was under communications and marketing copy and uh, PR and this kind of thing. Um, and I mean, that's in high demand, but it's not exactly what people think about when they think about having a career as a writer. Hmm, right, I gotcha. Yeah, I, I was thinking more um, because my own experience from it, I mean, not personal experience, but, you know, when I've been like job searching and stuff was like in journalism and in journalism, it's like they they only pay yeah. you, like, they, they don't keep you as a retainer unless you're like a really high talent for them usually yeah. like pay by article type deal with them so yeah. that, that was the perspective i was kind of uh coming at coming at yeah. with but granted i'm not sure if you've necessarily had experience in that that type of field necessarily with traditional journalism no but for like online blogs i've worked for blogs before um and that's kind of i mean you've for the blogs i worked for at least it was very much kind of you write and you write whatever and we pay you whatever it was very it was pretty easy i think it just wasn't a lot of money all right fair enough yeah. um but i guess uh with your own personal writings because uh, unfortunately uh at the t at the time of this interview i didn't have a chance to necessarily read a lot of your novels so i had to yeah. skim through a lot of your um blog work mm -hmm. that you've done and you talk about some pretty interesting subjects i, I remember uh, I, I can't remember the date for it but i think you were trying to go for a scholarship for like a, a beer company to like it's like a beer taste tester or something like that oh yeah no, that was a long time ago now yeah but i did uh <laughs> yeah i uh um uh, yeah when i was doing my master's i uh, i applied for this uh world of beer internship and uh as a part of the application process you had to record a video like a one minute video of um and my idea was pretty funny i just kind of i put the this traditional french song from uh Brittany, so very celtic um and just uh chugged a beer in front of the camera right and it took a minute <laughs> um did it pan out for you at all in any way uh, I mean, people thought it was somewhat fun, but people, I mean, I, this is my first foray really into kind of trying to see how this works for like, this is really before influencer was such a big word, but the people who ended up winning the, uh, internship, I put that in quotations too, they were already, they already had massive following. So it was clear they were just looking for influencers, right? Well, um, it makes sense. Yeah. Which I was not. <laughs> Uh, but no, I mean, people who did that, they thought it was really funny. People got a kick out of it too, especially since, you know, it's an interesting take on the kind of, uh, the, the prompt. And it's right. kind of, a uh... yeah, I got you. Um, <laughs> another one that I saw is you were kind of talking about like the, um, like the nature of like, you know, you basically like your analysis of like, uh, Twitch, right. And then I think you did like, you know, kind of observations about like how the chat is kind of like more of like a comparative like a spectator oh, in, yeah yeah, yeah. In uh, you're reading my old so. old blog <laughs> yeah 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 i do remember uh because um yeah because twitch is twitch was crazy when i first heard about it because i didn't really i wasn't really into streaming stuff until like 2015 2016 and uh it was wild to see what uh like the people i don't know there's this um do you know like uh this old movie called uh ed tv or the truman show there were these two like sister movies from the 90s early 2000s yeah the truman about show how, uh, truman show is more famous there was also this show called ed tv i think it was ed tv where the guy was just recording his life going everywhere whatever and that's essentially what twitch has become but um, <laughs> um yeah no it was wild because uh uh at the time, like YouTube Let's Plays were still more popular than Twitch. It was kind of that transitioning period. Uh, and I was like, I was just starting to understand why people liked Twitch. And I remember writing that and being like trying to mull through my own thoughts about uh, why it was interesting. I remember I thought about this relatively recently, too. One of the weird things about Twitch to me, as someone who um, uh, has experiences with older internet and kind of building communities online, is... Um, in older chat rooms, uh, 
you didn't have this weird kind of it was less like being in an audience while someone's performing on stage and more of a communal conversation right if you're on twitch the conversation is so dominated by everything that that the streamer says you can't really have a conversation among the audience right like uh, stuff like that has been i think regulated more towards like you know reddit and things like that and yeah, yeah of a, in a way. to a mixed degree twitter x or you know whatever yeah. you want to call it but uh i mean the big uh the big difference there for like reddit or anything reddit was like replaced forms and now reddit's even outdated uh it was but, like actual chat rooms like irc or uh or uh aim and msn messenger all these outdated things right uh which i mean discord kind of takes the place but discord's different too because it tries to do a lot of things at once and it can't really decide on an image. Um, but uh, this goes the most similar, I would say, where you can have these kind of communal, instantaneous conversations that are meant to build communities. Uh, yeah, but there was definitely, that was like a culture shock for me, an internet culture shock about uh, uh, getting into Twitch being this kind of a, uh, where all these people in a chat room, we can have our own conversations, but then it gets completely derailed if the streamer decides to say something funny. So, um, so do you still follow any aspect of like Twitch nowadays, or are you just mostly out of the scene? It was just like a brief interaction. I uh, I still watch Twitch. Twitch is a uh, my main. I kind of I stopped mostly watching YouTube stuff. YouTube is more like a like I don't really watch YouTube YouTubers anymore. If I'm watching like any kind of, I guess I haven't really thought about this until just now talking to you, but I don't really know I watch YouTubers anymore. And if I'm watching internet content creators, it's probably on Twitch because it's easy to kind of just put it on and relax, maybe say something like type an emote in chat, right? That's a simple, simple, uh, simple way to interact and uh, not have to worry about it. Well, I, guess... I don't really know. <laughs> oh, no, no. Sorry. Go ahead. I don't really. Uh... I don't really know why. Although YouTube now is it's so different because YouTube is such a, like a professional thing now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say so. That definitely. <laughs> I think um, a lot of YouTube is very much like a captured audience, and that's harder to. Yeah, like. I wouldn't even say the cat. It's the production of it. I mean, I hadn't. I'd never seen a Mr. Beast video until like three weeks ago. And when I watched it, I was taken away by the fact that this is exactly like television, like cable television from 20 years ago. Like 100 percent. This is this is just what you'd see. It's like a, the guy uh, who's famous for podcasts now, uh, the bald guy. Podcast who, Boston. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, what I'm talking about right? He's uh, he has controversial takes and then, he, you know, everyone talks. Joe about Rogan. Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he was uh, he was famous back then because he had the stupid TV show. What was it called? Uh, uh, Fear Factor. Like, yeah, Fear Factor, right? And uh, Mr. Beast content is like exactly like Fear Factor. Even like you could feel where the commercial breaks would go in. <laughs> right. Well, I, well, I, what I meant by like a captured audience in the sense that yeah. you know, uh, I I think like a lot of audiences have already been established. So even if you do have kind of like that professional like. Um, kind of layout to your program or whatever it's still hard to get an audience because well it's due to a lot of factors like the algorithm yeah. already guides people towards already large creators different things yeah. like that and the fact that you even have to like yeah that's i mean i'm sure it's the same thing in the podcast game now uh but people i imagine maybe that's a part of it but in general on in any kind of any kind of creative aspect that's largely distributed on the internet. Uh, the successful people are not creating content for humans to consume. They're creating it for the algorithm. Which is wild. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, myself, I, I kind of, uh, I'm trying to, I guess, embrace more the drudgery of, like, independent podcasting, you know? Yeah. Um, with kind of all of its rough aspects. <laughs> But yeah. now with like uh like like you were saying with like um how a lot of these modern YouTube shows are like a lot more professional, I think um well a lot of that probably does stem from the fact that, you know, people some people view like YouTube not as like an end in and of itself, but as like kind of a jumping off point because like Mr. Beast, for example, got a deal with uh Amazon Prime to do a show with them. 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's kind of seen as like an in between, like kind of a testing ground, you know, to like maybe show off a pilot that it then mm. eventually gets like picked well, up. I think there, there's there's a lot of confusion between like the difference between what is a platform and what is a medium and what is a uh, um what is a product, what is a piece of art. These are all questions that are being asked, and nobody if they don't have questions they're because they're worried about putting out the next thing that gets picked up by the algorithm so they can have money so they can eat so they can make another video to put out something that gets picked up by the algorithm so they can have money so that they can eat so that they can work on another video, this kind of thing. A um, brutal cycle. It's a, it's a nauseating cycle worthy of a uh, sart. Yeah, um I, I don't know if you if you probably um like read this at all but recently like there was an article done on like mr beast actually where he was talking about like uh he kind of finds his work miserable because uh he due to the nature how he's like he but a lot of people like him create content like he has to basically strip his personality from it because you know i think he was like like you, if you put your personality in something, you risk not being liked, and um, yeah. could it be me? Yeah, you know? is, yeah. like, <laughs> the, uh, the the mainstream audience appeal thing, right? Like if you look at Joe Rogan on the um, on Fear Factor, right? He's this very bland personality compared to what he's known for today. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's either like you hyper focus on like specific <laughs> audience, or you go broad. Um, yeah. Well, that's what like, you know the difference between uh, the guy. Um, uh, the uh, late night host people, right? The one that's the most bland and he's the most successful, Jimmy Fallon. Yeah, Jimmy Fallon. I mean, you could have gone with uh, what's his name, Corbin, I think. Uh, I don't know. There's I a lot of names you could have substituted in. Yeah, speaking of stuff that, yeah, this, I mean, another great example. That's like one of the major stuff. Like, if you ever look at YouTube and you're not logged into your account, that's all over YouTube, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I guess, uh, sorry, I kind of got sidetracked there. Um, but I guess for yourself, yeah. because uh, with Twitch, a lot of like creators are finding kind of success in like you know streaming while they're working on their craft. You know, you have like yeah. the arts channels and things like that. Yeah. Uh, is that something that you've considered for your own work? I tried or? it. I tried it when uh, when I was doing the podcast stuff because um, the podcast that I did was uh, very strange. Uh, and uh, it was about, it was like a, the whole structure of it was we would have like three different guests and it was set to music. Uh, and I was collaborating with a, a, do you know what Vaporwave is? I don't think Vaporwave is known as a thing anymore. Well, like, uh, I know it kind of like as a, like a music genre in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like slowed down 80s music. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, when that was really popular and then lo-fi hip hop be- started becoming popular and I was, uh, I started working with a bunch of them and we'd feature them like, because I would get, I don't know why, but I thought that I had to different music every week. So I'd get different music for every segment and we'd have narration between them introducing the show and then introducing each segment. And then there'd be people telling stories or reciting poetry, just kind of expressing themselves. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, and, I mean, I was, which was kind of a fun new thing or fun at that time, it was already kind of old. Um, uh, but I thought it'd be kind of a fun way to try promoting things, but we, you know, me recording myself, trying to record a segment for the show. Uh, the problem with my internet was very bad, right? <laughs> it's hard to uh, stream anything when you uh, don't have good internet. Right. Uh, I mean, hopefully, it was a fun uh, experiment. which, uh, has announced like some tech changes that they want to kind of address that to where, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, at I that time, though, my, my computer could barely run, though. I was using, a, a, like, a free laptop that was... It constantly ran out of RAM. It was a wild time, the way that we made that show work. Huh. Uh, especially since, yeah, that was kind of when I started... When I, that was when I learned, too, that writing is a skill that people value, because uh, writing was, came pretty easy to me. And uh, so I would, like, have write stuff, but then I started writing for other people as well. And, uh, yeah, that was kind of fun. Some people have all the luck. <laughs> I don't know, it hasn't, it hasn't uh, amounted to the, the most success, but uh, it has, uh, it's been difficult to say. It is difficult, I don't know, it's weird to, uh, I don't know, maybe it's character flaw, right? But I, do, I don't like uh, coming across as arrogant, right? I like, uh, maybe I'm too humble, that kind of thing, right? So it, it is difficult to say, but it's important to understand where your skills lie. Um, 
But uh, so unfortunately, just Twitch fell out with you over time, or what? Uh, the thing that I use, I mean, uh, I use it pretty passively I've, to this day. But I don't, I don't, I don't stream on Twitch ever. And uh, no, uh, no, no, ever just, since uh, those experiments, uh, um, especially like we would experiment too, because like it was fun because we had people all over the world, right? So I would, if it wasn't me, I'd have someone else somewhere else in the world trying to stream. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's all in the past. I, I didn't really pick it up after that because it was, uh, the tech was difficult. I didn't have it. I didn't have good internet. Uh, and no one watched it. <laughs> it was a waste of time in, in every sense of the word. Dang, well, so, sorry to hear that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, I guess, um, I, I guess with the nature of writing, because, um, I think from my understanding, I, I mean, I don't know, like, the actual numbers of it, but, like, I, I think, like, a lot of, like, reading as a hobby has obviously kind of, I think, gone down with time, mm -hmm. supposedly. I mean, I'm not I'm not really sure what the numbers are on that, but um, does that ever kind of discourage, like, you from approaching uh, certain types of writing in the sense that, you know, I, I imagine, like, it has to be harder to capture to like get an audience you know as as like a writer as opposed to like i think other mediums like streaming and stuff like that i uh i don't i don't know if that's true i think it's uh it's more i do think i do understand uh the appearance of that um but there's multiple ways that i would refute that statement the biggest and most obvious one is that th there's actually a rather large literary industry. It just kind of probably doesn't correspond with anything, any kind of uh, content you consume. It doesn't always align with the kind of content I consume, right? Like the very, there's a lot of like Mr. B, Mr. Beast type content just in book form to put it in a, in a, in a way about something we've already talked about, right? These people who put out very bland books, but they sell well. And, uh, uh, they do it all the time. So well, that's one thing. Throw an example, like who? Um, I don't even because I mean, I, for me personally, I don't really strive because if I wanted to just do like a bland book, I uh, I would just do corporate content. I'd work in an office and do PR. So I don't really, I don't even keep up with that. But uh, like the, the um, uh. A kind of a classic example at this point would be something like the Hunger Games, but it's kind of past. And then you had a, a bunch of people who were, there was a, like 10 years of people doing generic uh, dystopian teenage girl stories, right? Well, right, like it's a whole like, it's yeah. a whole like sub-genre in and of itself. Yeah, and, yeah. whether this is YouTube or, uh, or books or movies or anything like this, it all has a very similar kind of thing. It's just kind of a... The audiences are different, and uh, what is popular at any given time will also be different. Um, and you try and strive for something like higher than that, essentially, in your work. I would imagine. I don't know about higher, but it's just kind of. Um, I have my own kind of things that I. I don't want to like. Uh, if I'm going to sacrifice a, a, a part of myself, uh, I'm going to negotiate for it. Let's say, I'm not just going to give up. Right, everything for a price. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. But like, um, um, yeah. So that's one aspect of it where the 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 book industry is thriving. It's probably just completely outside of your view. And uh, uh, there's a whole there's whole bunches of genres and subgenres of things that are incredibly popular. Uh, uh, surprisingly so, especially if you go into like uh just ebooks, right? So if you want to try to save your costs and only publish as an ebook, right? You'll be uh, surprised at the titles you read when you scroll through Amazon. <laughs> uh, some of them, uh, uh, I'll just say like, uh, romance is more popular than you would probably think. Well, yeah, that probably makes sense. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's so weird because uh, in terms of film, which is like, you know, my, my speciality. Yeah. Like, it seems like romance is kind of like gone from the film genre. I don't. I mean, it's probably because a lot of yeah. it is so dominated by like superheroes and stuff like that. But even like as a subgenre, I can't think of like the last big romance film that came out. And I don't know if that's just because I don't follow romance films in general. Yeah, there's probably a bit of that. It's probably too. I think um, 
this will this is related to the previous topic in a way, but um, uh, it's because there's no there, there aren't really like medium budget films anymore just in general, and I think with the romance genre, your rom com kind of thing was more medium to small budget film, right? And now if you're not like a huge Hollywood blockbuster or a uh, like a tiny indie movie, you're just not gonna get made. Uh, some of that has been picked up by like a Hallmark or like Netflix, right? But, oh, uh, well, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, usually, they, I mean, they, they don't have the best reputation for a reason. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess so. As I think about it. Uh, because, um, I don't know, like, the one big romance film I remember was, like, I don't know, it was, like, Valentine's Day, or it was, like, a movie based around Valentine's Day, and it had, like, kind of this ensemble cast with a lot of, like, big list actors, and that was, like, a big appeal of the movie. God, I wish I could remember the name of it, it's, but uh, yeah, even that was, like, relatively awesome. old. Yeah. You're, it's also kind of, um, uh, when you're talking about this, too, uh, uh, you're probably thinking about this in terms of a very American-centric, English-speaking uh, audience market. Yeah, guilty uh, as charged. <laughs> you got me there. You English. got me there. Yeah. And uh, uh, I wouldn't doubt it, you know, that, uh, but I mean, that's also what you're concerned about, right? The same thing with me. I know that, like, for English speakers, uh, romance has kind of continually been a pretty popular genre, especially on the Kindle store, which is funny because it's not really my thing. Yeah, um, yeah I gotcha. <laughs> um, uh, but I mean, the thing is, like, the American film market does dominate so much of, like, just the broader scene in general, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty safe thing to say. Uh, but it's not to say that you know these things do exist. And I think that uh, uh, specifically for these kind of medium budget films, if you're if you're in a non-American market, you're more likely to like get subsidies or have the local community support these medium budget films with local actors and whatnot. Um. Well, speaking of movies, though, uh, I, I hate to ask this because you know it's like. You know, I know all. Not all writing is the same, and it's kind of like uh, the whole Mitch Hedberg bit of like asking a cook if they could farm. But um, <laughs> have you ever thought about writing for movies? Uh, I mean, I have, but it's not. Uh, but uh, that's very close to this other kind of thing that you're talking about when you're saying like, oh, maybe people don't read, right? Uh, because usually, people are, when they think about reading, they think about specifically books but they don't really think about it. there's a lot of reading people do uh on twitch right you're reading chat all the time or if it's in a video game or you know a movie is there's a script behind a movie right uh so you have these different avenues for writing as a creative outlet that are also uh at a core they start with someone with an idea and a pen um so yes, and I think that more broadly, that's how you can, you, I think that you can expand the definition of reading, unless you're specifically talking about the literary industry market or the book market in general, wherein you need to analyze, you know, what's selling specifically or why what you're writing does not match what is currently selling uh, as a book. Um, not to say that either one is uh, uh, dead or thriving more or less or easier to get into or more difficult, just kind of... This, the, the, all these things exist as uh, outlets, which is... I don't know, it's interesting at the very least, right? I don't oh, know yeah, if that yeah, answers yeah. your question, but it's, it's kind of... Um, yeah, and, and, and a lot of, like, the script writing... The topic. Yeah, yeah, and, like, a lot of script writing, too, has kind of shifted more towards... Well, I mean, not a lot, but I, I do know that there are a lot of, like, script where writers are, or just writers in general that are moving more towards, like, the video essay format because, you know, that is, like, a popular subgenre on youtube um, yeah speaking of youtube right? <laughs> oh, well right yeah. yeah well i think uh the more kind of interesting prophetic question would be uh when when are we going to get a feature length uh a feature length film that is shot in vertical aspect ratio that's what i'm looking forward to i feel like that has to have been a thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, like I'm not even kidding. kidding. Like, oh my yeah. god, I can't. Uh, <laughs> would Quibi can't? No, oh, I don't know. Like, if the Quibi films were shot like that. No, I think they were shot in like uh, visual aspect ratio. Yeah. Because well, I know I'll there's like that, films yeah. that were shot like with like they advertise like shot on iPhone, but they probably use like you know, it's probably done like in post processing to where they um, 
you know, expand it to the usual ratio, or maybe like the iPhone can shoot at like the typical like film ratio. Yeah, I imagine you're gonna have to feel like the actual pioneers of this. Like, it's gonna be the generation that grew up, you know, just doing everything in vertical aspect ratio. Maybe. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know because wouldn't it always have that association of like shorter form content, like with the vertical maybe. aspect? Uh, but I mean, yeah. And it would have to, uh, like, change how you, like, frame shots and things like that. Yeah, it would projection. be a challenge for sure. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. The future is uh, it's always interesting. And I think that the, what is least expected is always kind of... Or what people... Uh, because, you know, it's, it's art, right? The, the artist... So when you go out when you step behind the industry, when you're not analyzing the market to try to figure out what's going to be profitable with current trends, the artist is looking to subvert the current trends and then everyone follows them, right? Well, yeah. uh, and and if someone found success with the you know uh, whether it's a book or that is uh, non-standard for the market in regards to genre or formatting or a film that's shot in aspect ratio and there's no projector that's prepared to shoot it, uh, the f- that kind of subversion is is important I think in general for art. Well, with like the whole aspect ratio thing, though, I think, you know, um, a lot of uh, kind of with the way that like a lot of modern films are made, it's always like with adaptability in mind because, you know, filmmakers obviously yeah. know that like, you know, people watch their works in different like, you know, yeah. different so aspects. Maybe, I mean, t- to me, uh, that's just a stronger argument, right? Because you're going to have more and more people who don't even go to the theaters. They just watch it on their phone, right? Uh, maybe i mean don't, don't tell other film tubers that all right there that's like a hellscape for them i've been advocating more for like day and date releases for movies but you know don't tell other people that yeah i don't know i mean it's a, people are always I, I understand it right because you you, you kind of sacrilegious uh you know if you're desecrating the altar this kind of thing whether it's uh, in a church or in a theater uh people hold their sacred idols and with due respect um but it is all i don't know it's also funny because i grew up the generation who would download things from dodgy websites and it was like you know less than 180p and watch whole movies like that <laughs> um well yeah and uh so well i'm sorry i really got sidetracked there um <laughs> But I guess uh, focusing back a bit <laughs> on your own work, <laughs> um, I know you're like working on multiple things at like a time, I would imagine. But um, what, yeah. what big projects do you have in the future that you, w- you would like to tease um, here? I, uh, so right now I'm currently uh, writing a new novel called Rayanne. And it's set in the same world as, uh, as uh, the novel I've released uh, in September called Meneus and it's um it's a it's been quite the undertaking uh I've just recently finished kind of the first rough draft and I'm going through a first round of edits and um it's looking like it's going to be upwards of 70k words which is it's in the kind of a fantasy adventure genre uh is acceptable uh, but that's industry talk that you don't necessarily care to talk about. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I mean, well, so <laughs> doing here, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's more interesting than the story itself, right? So uh, it's kind of like a prequel to Menaeus, uh, but not really. It's just kind of set in the same story and and uh, in the same setting, rather, and uh, takes place before it. But there wasn't that kind of intentional, you know, I guess there was, I don't know. I don't like defining things that way. And if you, uh, yeah, if you look at Meneus, you'll see why. Because Meneus is this, uh, this, uh, this project on where uh, you, it's very uh, opaque. And uh, I wanted it to mimic the style and structure of uh, more ancient epics, right? So uh, more oral traditions uh, from people around the world. And so you have uh, you have the story about what I call a curse, but I think uh, other people told me I should say I call it uh, trauma, which isn't inappropriate. 
uh, and how it goes from one generation to the next, right? And so each section of the story is split up between these different generations and how they deal with fighting against this kind of majestic evil, right? And the sacrifices they have to make, because it's yeah, when you're when you're um, when you're drawing inspiration from old stories, there's a lot of tragedy. Uh, but this is also a kind of, so this, um, Rayon is also an attempt to make that world more digestible for the, the person who isn't as much a, of a nerd for, uh, ancient history as I am. Um, one aspect that I kind of want to ask about, like, your, uh, about like i guess your writing process in general is yeah. like because for myself i've talked about in the podcast before that i personally had aspirations of kind of doing a uh, video essay work but um yeah. I, I i didn't want to because to be honest i hate proofreading my own writing so i, I just hated doing scripted <laughs> content in general um yeah I don't know. Is is there is that like a blight that you have, or I I guess is there any aspect of the writing process that you know, even though I know you like love writing, that you yeah. yourself dislike though about it? Uh, well, I have a I have a pretty big I have kind of a complex a chip on my shoulder because I'm not a strong reader. I have a, one of my eyes isn't very good. Uh, I technically, I have a lazy eye, but it's not the kind that you can like see and make fun of me for. Uh, but it makes it so I can't see very well and I read slowly. Um, uh, so I always feel kind of uh, nervous about talking about, you know, being a writer and enjoying writing, right? Because I'm not the biggest reader and not a strong reader, but I do like reading what I like to read. Um, that's what I would call where my personal kind of complexes lie. For the process itself, um, I think you could divide it into these kind of different sections of what is more and less fun. Um, there are the, uh, I don't even know that because I don't know. It's really, it's, it's difficult for me to explain because I really do just kind of enjoy writing. Um, so there's nothing that I would necessarily call unfun, but there's definitely things that are harder and difficult or more difficult or easier. And I think, uh, the hardest bit is definitely, uh, whether you call it writer's block or, uh, waiting for inspiration but this kind of if you ever have this moment where your motivation runs dry uh trying to work through that is can be miserable is difficult and i think that um uh forcing through it is also never really a good option right it's like a i, I use the metaphor of a train right it's like you have a train ticket for this project for this piece of writing for this art piece that you're working on and if you miss your train, you have to wait for the next one in order to board on and finish it or get to your destination. Um, so that's the most difficult thing. And if I were to say the most unfun part is, is further down the line, because even like the first few edits are fun because there's, there's so much like just stuff you miss that is horrible. Or you're like, how did I even write that? Why am I? I'm such a bad writer. Why am I? Why did I put that there? That's, that part's kind of fun to me. Um, it's like when you get to the third, fourth, fifth pass where you're like making sure that the commas are in the right space and all the, you accidentally put an apostrophe there. That's annoying. <laughs> I guess as a writer that does a lot of creative work, uh, I, I guess I'm curious to kind of get your take on this with uh, the the famous quote from, I, I believe it was Truman Capote said that like, well, I mean, I'm paraphrasing roughly because yeah. I don't know exactly what he said, but that like creative writing isn't something that could really be taught, that it's just something that like, it, that can't be taught like other forms of writing. I guess as a creative writer yourself, what is your take on that? Uh, I, when I was younger, I didn't believe that it was true. I've slowly kind of come to accept it. Like what I've said, I've said this multiple times now, but I've struggled to accept writing as a skill, right? And it's because of this kind of thing. I truly believed that you could teach someone to be a creative writer or to express themselves. And so why would anyone value my ability to do that? Um, but as I grow older, I do definitely see that it's value in, uh, in that kind of uh, finding ease in self-expression, finding ease in being able to adapt a voice. Um, that one's really, especially in the business world, right? Because, you know, uh, like if you read a quote from someone in a press release, it was written by someone like me. <laughs> um, 
Well, yeah, for myself, I've, I've always been kind of mixed on that quote because I, I, I think, like, in some level it's possible, but I, I guess in terms of, like, being a good creative writer, like, you know, it, it's like... I, I guess kind of like a sport, right? Where some people have like, you know, you could train somebody to like enhance their skill in a sport, but past the point you have to like take into account like one's own yeah. build and physique. And yeah. I, I guess creative writing might be in, in a similar sense, but then of course you get into like, you know, what it means to be like, what is like good writing if you want to get into, yeah. you know, the whole subjective scale of it all so Which, i don't know I, I guess i always find it as like kind of a difficult um yeah well that's kind of yeah it comes down to down to the same question like the whole kind of uh if you don't read or you're not familiar with the literary industry then books are invisible and it seems like the market's not very big um when you're when you're doing anything if you're if you're not uh the how you how you how you deal with feedback how you how you how you perceive others, how you perceive your own work, right? You have to understand that in context. How do you define good? How do you define bad, right? So if you're like, um, yeah, my, this uh, fantasy adventure story that I'm writing on, if someone who only reads sci-fi reads the first three pages and it's like, this is complete crap, well, of course you're not going to like it. It's not a genre you enjoy. Or, you know, like me with romance, right? Uh, I'm not going to... Uh, I don't ex I don't expect the people who love romance to pick up a non-romance novel and be like, this is the best thing ever, right? The same way that I'm not going to pick up a romance novel and particularly enjoy it because it's some cheesy romance, right? But some people do. Yeah, and it's uh, I guess it's been outed that I don't know how to read. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, well, it is. It is. You, you're touching on a very interesting thing because a part of a part of like writing books, this kind of thing, is um, uh, you see a similar thing in games. I'm the most intimate with these two industries, um, uh, where because there's this kind of um, uh, like a, the outside perspective of these industries is that you know it's a dream job. You are you are working on. Uh, you're working on something that is has this incredible prestige, um, and because of that, they can mask the fact that you know there are accountants and salespeople working on crunching numbers to make sure that everything bounces out and that the graph on the Excel file goes up and to the right. I guess um, I, I, I kind of wanted to touch on like an early, well, loosely touch on something you said earlier in that, you know, you're saying that you didn't like the Hunger Game novels. Um, and oh, obviously yeah. there's like an audience for that. So I guess I'm curious, what other like writing hot I mean, takes I, just, I, I mean, I think, I think, I think Hunger Games is fine. It's just kind of not, I wasn't a huge nah, fan. Don't lie to me. We had, we had it recorded. You said you hated it. <laughs> um... <laughs> I'm not a. Uh, I'm a bigger fan of. I read more like nonfiction and philosophy texts than I do fiction in general. Uh, but then you know I'm very. Uh, what I'm what I'm best at is writing fiction. So it's a. Uh, it's annoying. To well, me, yeah, I mean, yeah. Give me, <laughs> give me, give me some hot takes. Um. I mean, don't worry. Nobody's gonna listen to this. <laughs> No, he's got to listen 48 minutes in. I can say whatever I want. Dennis, I'm going to fight you tomorrow. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't like thinking about hot takes in general. I don't know. Because uh, it's on. also I'm that's, in the trenches. That's, that's a weak answer. Come on. Uh, <laughs> because uh, I guess I, I really I don't have this kind of like I don't have because uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm too old, too. I just kind of if something doesn't interest me, I don't really think that I hate it. I just kind of leave it alone. No, but like nothing controversial, like something that's like generally accepted in the writing world that you that you don't agree with. Um, there's a systemic thing that I could talk about, but it's very complicated. It's yeah, the go kind for it. Of, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> go for it. I I do think that like in the right like uh, at least in the Anglo writing sphere, especially the American Anglo uh, writing sphere, if you're not in LA and New York and you didn't graduate from the right college, it's a lot harder to get into the industry. Um, but it's also, uh, 
uh, yeah, it's all starting to kind of transform because of uh, uh, indie books are becoming a viable option for a lot of authors. And you're having a lot of agencies shaking up and uh, a lot of agents kind of struggling to describe what value they add to authors. And I mean, I'm speaking of this as I'm an unagented author who's indie published three novels, right, and hasn't made a ton of money. But I can, you know, I, I have to know what's happening in the industry because I, you always hope, right? <laughs> That's the dream. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's this kind of a, a lot of the literary industry right now is kind of in the spot that the music industry was in the early 2000s. Where it was just like dinosaur industry that didn't adapt to modern times. But I mean, it's still around. And I, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's going to disappear tomorrow and uh you know it's it's yeah, at the end of the day it's a lot of relationship building and you don't want to tarnish uh reputations or relationships before they have even been made um no i mean it'll always have its audience i, I would imagine <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know it's not that uh, yeah, it all have the audience, but it's like the difference because in the early 2000s, what you had was you know the rise that you had Napster and downloading thing by the music industry. It was so wasteful before they thought that they were they had this incredible hubris that they would never fall. Right. No. Um, yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, it's, it's it's weird now because it's kind of reverted, right? Because everyone just pays for streaming things and they have complete control. No one owns their own music anymore, right? And then when Spotify takes a song off, nobody no can nobody has access to their own music collection. Oh yeah, I mean, I've uh, I've talked to a few musical artists on the on the program. Yeah, and as an, as an artist, you get no money. Right? They recently changed things too. Um, but uh, and I mean, you have for as like an author, as a book writer, um, Amazon has done this incredible thing where they've made it viable to get physical books out in the world uh, with no budget. Whereas before, if you couldn't get an agent, that was like next to impossible. Or if you didn't have a publisher friend, right? Um, and that's pretty incredible. But at the same time, it's kind of, you know, you lower the buried entry, you lower uh, the expectations of costs and whatnot. And it makes it a, uh, it makes people have to rethink the entire business. So, uh... and, I, uh, and that's kind of a, you know, a part of the reason why I, uh, I even attempted to, you know, I've put out these books and, and uh, have been focusing on that for a little while now is, uh, you know, I was trying to get away from this kind of hyper corporate business structure. Right? <laughs> um, but it is what it is. It is, uh, it is the world, right? Money makes the world go around and everyone wants to get their bag. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> no, so I guess. Uh... I, I know we talked about like you know your upcoming projects but i guess i don't know i i, I hate this question in like a in like a job interview context but i, I think i yeah. like it more in like a podcasting context yeah. uh but i guess like even in the broader like like future like even you know years down the line i guess where do you where do you see yourself oh, with, yes. your career, with your career and your work um, that's a good question, right? If I'm still alive, uh, hopefully, uh, I'll be doing something creative with writing. Whether that, if that's, you know, being picked up and actually writing books full time and making money from it, or going back to an office where I'm valued as a creative writer, either one of those would be ideal to me. Um, I guess for any of your fans that are listening to this or anyone that is interested broadly in reading or that maybe they've they're listening to you and say oh this guy's pretty interesting um what well, who what writers would you recommend to you know so, for people to kind of understand like your tastes as you know a writer or an artist or what have you yeah i think for my writing my biggest influence it's going to depend on the exact book but uh i find myself more inspired by uh by a variety of by a variety of things right uh aesthetics let's call them um i really enjoy the sound of words 
Uh, and for that, I really like uh, a lot of rap and hip hop and above all the late MF Doom. And he inspires me to kind of capture a certain like charismatic voice that I, uh, I think you can hear when you read my books. Um, that's a big one. For generic story structures, I'd go more to the realm of video games and especially Final Fantasies. And I'd, I'd credit uh, Hironobu Sakaguchi, the guy behind the first ones, kind of that whole franchise, as uh, being the inspiration there. Um, and then uh, for a kind of a visual aesthetic that captures how uh, I like to make things feel, if you know the painter Edward Hopper, I like to capture how he makes me feel. Sorry, I had a call issue for a sec. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Um, but I guess since uh, we are here, we are kind of approaching um, the hour mark. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for our listeners for joining us today. Uh, if you want to support the show, you can do so in a number of different ways. Um, if you want to do a one-time donation, I recommend my uh, Ko-Fi account. Uh, Ko-Fi also lets you do like the monthly option, but I would much prefer my listeners go to Patreon for monthly donations because you have different war tiers, um, one of which is you get your name read aloud in the credits, but I don't have any patrons at the moment, so the section's blank. But you also get like unique merch and stuff like that. Uh, but if you want to do one-time donation and get something from it, I also have a merch store with uh, art by Nocturnal Esset, George Isaac. He is a frequent collaborator on the program. Uh, John, thank you so much. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm sorry. The links for all this can be found on my Twitter or X account or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, the, the social media platform formerly known as Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> at podcasting pasta, all one word, uh, P's are lowercase. I'm not sure if it, I don't, I don't think it matters for the platform. Um, John, thank you so much for joining us. If you want to shout out where people can find your work or you know just yeah. connect with you in general the easiest way to find me and my work is to go to johnbauer.substack.com you'll find links to my books and my uh, newsletter and you can follow along as i finish my latest project rayan and we all definitely look forward to um you know enjoying more of your work thank you so much for joining us john and to everyone listening uh or watching, also in video format. Uh, take care. Goodbye.